We live in a world, and that's one of the things that he's basically going to end by asking his people to do in verse 15, is he says, you've got to make a choice who's going to be the one you worship. People worship a whole lot of things. Some things we just started this season, it's called football. They worship a lot of things. Worship a lot of people. Worship a lot of money. Our biggest issue is we worship ourselves. We just want to do what we want to do, when we want to do it, how we want to do it. And we really don't want God to get in the way unless we need him. Kind of like the tire in the trunk of the car. So what Joshua is doing, and again, these people didn't listen, so we're just going to kind of rehearse what he said. And it's mostly remembering the grace of God in their lives. And all of us could do that. We did a little bit of this last night at the Young at Heart meal. And we just remembered some things that how good God had been, you know, to us. And I think every one of us would have different stories, but all of them would have that element in it. I mean, we all have different upbringings. We all have different situations, different backgrounds. I know a lot of y'all's stories because you've told me your story. And that, that enhances my life. That's something I'd encourage you to do inside this church family. Get to know the people you go to church with. So if you go out to eat with them, if you go over their house... Ask them how they came to Christ, what God did. Mine's pretty simple. I had a good mom and a good daddy. I, Jesus was front page news in my house 24-7, 365. Not everybody's life is like that. But it's all the grace of God. Everybody in this room should never get over the grace of God and the goodness of God. What the choir was singing about. The cross and what he's done and how he's forgiven us, saved us, redeemed us. And what we have because of him. These verses that we're going to look at in just a few minutes are not verses of the great ancestry of the Jewish people. It's the great grace of the Jewish people's God. The greatness about my story or your story is not us. It's him. My life's a mess sometimes. Here's one thing Joshua said in chapter 23, verse 14. I think it's a cool verse of scripture. He says, behold, this day I, I am going the way of all the earth. That's just a biblical way of saying I'm getting ready to die. And ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls, you know this completely. Thoroughly, that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you. Not one thing hath failed. I failed, you failed, we've all failed. God has never failed. God has been so good to me. When I hear other people's stories, sometimes I almost feel guilty at the life that I had. I, I talked a little bit about this last night, and, and we might mention it again in these, in these verses as we go through it. But just I, I didn't pick the home I was born in. I was clueless to how good and blessed I was to have the home I had. I didn't pick that. God just gave me the mom and daddy that I got. They weren't perfect. I think they, over at Mount Sinai, I think my mom is perfect, but I live with her. She ain't. But what, what, a, what, what, a, what a heritage. But listen to y'all. My heritage is not a Robert's heritage. My heritage is God's story. My mom and daddy were, were complete opposites when it comes to how they were raised. My mama was raised uh, by a godly man and woman and in church. And Jesus, again, was front page news. And my daddy was raised as godless as you possibly could be raised over on Judson Mill in Greenville and then Pelzer. But in the providence of God, and you've heard me probably tell this story, in the providence of God, he had a good friend that lived in Katichi. 
And he would come over to Katichi and hang out with Harold Nicholson. Harold became a Wesleyan preacher. God, one of the godliest men I ever knew. He's in heaven now. What a man. The last church was right up the road. I think it's on Shady Grove. Might be Shady Grove, Westland, or I can't remember the name. Doesn't matter. What a man. And my dad and my mom met. I have no clue how, how they got married because, because my dad was lost. I don't know if he told Papa and Mammy that he was saved or what. I don't, I don't know how that happened. I've not got all the details. I've had the conversation, but I've not got all the details on that. But they got married, and Daddy was lost, and they lived over in Greenville for a little while, and Mama was going to church. My, my mom was 97 years old. She's had a rough two weeks with this cyst on the back of her leg. She's talking about ready to die and wants to die and tired of living. Never seen my mom like this. But I guarantee she's in church this morning. She had to drag that bad leg in there. So she's going to church, and she went to this little Methodist church over there, not too far from Judson Mill, and Dad wouldn't go with her. And, but then he got to feeling bad because she's going to have to walk. They didn't have cars. It's right at the end of World War II, and it's poor, and didn't have a vehicle. And so she had to walk, and Dad didn't want to walk her by herself. And so he went in, <laughs> this little Methodist church. And first night, the preacher preached on hell. And Daddy, all the way home with probably some choice words for my mom, I ain't going back to that place. I'm done with that. That's all that man could talk about. Well, he went back the next night, because you know my mama, she's going back. Guess what? He preached on hell Tuesday night. He preached on hell Wednesday night. And my daddy got saved. Your story, my story, all our stories are grace stories. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. God's everything. God's amazing. God's wonderful. God's faithful. God's true. God's righteous. God's holy. God redeems. God forgives. God saves. God delivers. God gives peace. God gives comfort. God gives sleep. God gives answers. God gives healing. You just throw anything at the end of God, and it is. So what I want us to do is just go into this passage, and we've looked at this before. And I just want to read the first, second, third verse. And I'm just going to give you four little simple thoughts. And the fourth one will have just a few little applications to make. And I'm going to talk all of them about wrapped around the word grace. And, and, and the first one from 1, 2, and 3 of this chapter is I'm going to, say, I'm going to call it initiating grace. And, and, I, and on the premise of what the Bible says, there is none that seeketh after God. My daddy was not looking for God. But God was looking for him that's your story too my dad didn't want nothing to do with God or that church or that preacher that was preaching on hell for three nights in a row he didn't want anything to do with that and can I say that was none of us so here's what he was reminding them of of this initiating grace look at it in verse 1 and Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and call for the elders of Israel, for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. Again, not Joshua. Joshua was a nobody like the rest of them. They realized that this was a solemn assembly. Same thing today. This is a solemn assembly. You just got a man in a suit and tie in his pulpit. I'm no different, better, worse than you are. God's who we're meeting. You can do the same thing in the morning with your Bible, the devotion. It's God that you're bringing yourself into presence of. Not a man in a suit, the Word of God. So they all presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time. Terah, father of Abraham, the father of Nicor. And they served other gods. They were pagans. They were lost. They were blind. They were hopeless. They were helpless. They had no future. Until God paid Abraham a visit. Guess what? That's your story. That's your story. Man, I can I think about as I'm talking this morning, Charity, my daughter, she's right over there, oldest girl. Y'all know her. 
Man, I remember how many times I would talk to her about the, the Lord and, you know, different things and just praying that God would speak to her heart because it's a God thing, it's not a man thing, it's not a church thing. I don't want it to be a man thing, right? It's supernatural, it's spiritual, it's new birth, it's born from above, it's not born by Baptist. And we had been praying and We've told her things over and over, and it just didn't seem like there, there was a, making any inroads in her little heart. And man, she went to elementary chapel one day, and uh, Brother Jerry, I've already forgot his last name, he got up to preach, one of my good friends, pastor, he preached, and I think he preached on hell that day. And man, Charity could not wait to get home and talk to us. That's what God does. God pays you a visit. God knocks on your heart. God pricks your mind. God convicts you of sin. God shows you Jesus. God shows you your sin. God says I'm true. God says you can believe me. God says you can trust me. God says the world's a liar. That's what God does. Hallelujah. For the grace of God that steps into my life and says, whoa. Yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, he's the Savior. And again, I'm reminding you, it's, about, it's not about being a Baptist. It's about being a believer in the God of the Bible. Look at verse 3. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. Their heritage, their fame was God, never them. Our fame is the glory of the cross. That's our fame. That's who we are. In Christ. God initiates this story. So I just want you to think about that this morning. You think about your own grace story. You think about your own. I was telling this story. I think one of the, the, the nights I was preaching at the revival. I think. I, I can't remember. But I remember we had went to this uh, family's house at, at, at Oakwood and the couple was in our church in my Sunday school class that I had and they had a couple that lived in their apartment complex that they were really concerned about wanted me to come talk to them me and Wanda went over so it was them the couple that's in my Sunday school class saved believers and then this couple that's in their apartment that's not saved and I'm over there to talk to them about the gospel and then while they're there this other couple comes in and, and, ju and just burst in on our thing now, I wish I, could, I wish I could tell you that I was like, this could be the providence of God. and this, this, These could be people that need the Lord. Mm -mm. I was like, what are y'all doing here? I'm, I'm being honest. And I didn't even look at them. I was so consumed. This couple said, I'm going to have this couple. We know them. They're lost. And I'm so talking to them. I, I, I ignored them. They should have probably got their feelings hurt. I mean, I didn't even look at them. I'm thinking, I don't know who y'all are. Y'all should have come next night. So I'm talking to them. This couple, nothing. I mean, it's like pouring water over a duck's back. It's just, it just nothing. So we talked a little bit longer, had some coffee and cake or whatever we did that night. And we left that couple. <laughs> that couple follows us to our car. <laughs> and said, could you tell us more what you just told that other couple? The first thing the Spirit of God was telling me, you are so dumb as a preacher. That's what he's telling me. And I said, I know, Lord. I, I understand. And we led them to cry. They're still serving God. I'm just telling you. I'm not looking. I'm just a witness. But the God of the Bible's looking. And he's searching. And he's, and he's convicting. And listen, that happened to you. You did not deserve that. God don't save people because they're good. God don't save people because potentially they can be great. God saves people because he loves them, period. That's it. That means I can't do anything to get him to love me more. It's already a done deal. And he's been pursuing me my whole life. Just as he has yours. The initiating grace of God. Now, look in verses 5 through 12. We'll not read all these verses for sake of time. I didn't wear my watch this morning, but I got my phone. So I got my clock just in case anybody's worried. I don't have a timepiece. 
I heard they might put a clock on the back wall. I'm not sure. They're, they're praying about it, maybe, I think. But a big one. But it's going to be about that big around. From 5 to 12, I'm just going to call this the providing grace of God. Providing. And, and I'm just going to use two things. People. He mentions people that he provided. In verse 5, he says, I sent Moses. I sent Aaron. And Aaron's kind of there because Moses was goofy. And like we looked at in Exodus 3 and didn't think he could do it on his own. So I, I sent Aaron. And then later on, he says, you know, Moses, Aaron, um, your fathers. So, so Joshua would be one that had been sent to them. So, so he sent people. And then if, if you kind of start reading down in verse number 6, you've got the Red Sea and you've got the cloud by day and you've got the fire by night and you've got all kinds of ites, you know, Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, enemies, opponents. And, and Israel was always outmatched, outgunned, outtalented. That, that doesn't really matter when God's on your side. So sometimes you have to fight the battle or do something in the battle. Like Jericho, they had to walk around. They didn't do really anything, but just obey God and walk around. And the walls came down. Sometimes God just does it on his own. Verse 12, I sent the hornet before you, which drave them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with sword nor with bow. You didn't do a thing. You didn't raise a sword or even shoot an arrow. You didn't do nothing. I just took care of it. The providing grace of God. People that God sent into their lives. Think about that for just a minute. Think about that for just a minute. We're getting ready to celebrate homecoming. You know, and I haven't been here forever. I mean, church has been around for 130 years plus or whatever. I mean, I've just been here 24. Got a lot of good memories, right? God's been good to this church. And I was thinking about some names, and don't get offended because the, the list is huge after 24 years, but I can think of two names, just two names of two people that I remember. I mentioned this one guy just, just the other day because some of the wood stuff we still got around here is Mr. Odell. Mr. Odell was really sick pretty much and kind of not really coming, and you had to go see him in his house, and he went to his daughter's house in, in Easley. I never will forget the time. We were getting ready to do Thanksgiving thing, and I, I took a cassette player and I, did, I just sat down with Mr. Odell, and I, I just told Mr. Odell, I said, tell me about when you got saved. <laughs> and I'm just telling you. I mean, I, I wanted to pick up a chair and throw it out in the yard. As this old man just navigated through and just kept talking about the goodness of God in his life. I'll tell you another one. I had several. I don't know how I was going to mention, but Odell... Miss Jessie May. I remember every time I got to sit at that little kitchen that was on the front corner, we'd sit and we'd just reminisce and we'd just talk. People are gifts. Now, sometimes we're stinkers and the gift ain't that great, but we're gifts. I thank God for the people that's been brought into my life. In my first church, you've heard me mention this name. His name was Clyde Alexander. Clyde's in heaven. I, I preached his funeral. I was there when he died. The night he died, I was eating pound cake with peanut butter on it. His son-in-law said it was great. It's the first time I ever tried it, and it was. I remember going in the room that night when, when Clyde was really bad, and he had cancer all over the place, and he was in pain, and he just kept whispering to me real quietly, Preacher, I'm going home. And again, I mean, I one of the goofy moments. I said, Clyde, you are home. He said, no, preacher, I'm going home. And he died sometime in the middle of the night. Clyde was such a good friend. He wasn't just a church member. That's, that's so cold. He was a friend of mine. God's brought people into your life across your path. They're not perfect people. They don't always do the right thing, say the right thing, but there are people in your life that God's helped mold you, make you, encourage you, maybe correct you. I didn't always like what my, there was sometimes I wish my mom had been sent to somebody else's house. Because boy, she was tight. Her lines were tight. Her parameters were, mm. Thank God for the people that God's brought into your life. Think about them. 
over the afternoon. The providing grace of God just in situations of life. Some are natural, some are supernatural. All's God. It wasn't hard for the people of God when they were in the wilderness and God was raining down manna. Remember that? Remember I gave you that tonnage one? Now, I didn't do all the figuring on this because I'd never figured it out, but somebody did. 1.5 million people for 39 years would have been 4,500 tons of manna per day. I, I, that, 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 don't, that don't even make sense. What a miracle. That was supernatural. But when you get to the end of their journey, it's in the Bible, and it meticulously tells them the manna is about to stop, and you're going to have to now plant the seed, and I'm still going to make it grow. You know what he's saying? Even though you're involved, it's still me. That means your life, your breath, your strength, your job, your money, your life is all God. That doesn't mean you don't put forth effort. That doesn't mean you don't get engaged with your life. It just simply means behind it all is a God that is providing grace in your life. I'm 63. I'll be 64 in whatever days it is. September the 20th, I'll be 64. Uh, Sandy was saying the other day, quit saying I owe you, That's how old I am too. Sandy Gardner. 64. I know all the hats I've worn down through the years. I mean, I've been pastoring since I was 19. We had our first little girl, 21. Good night, life got really quick, really fast. I know without a shadow of a doubt, and many of you know this, whatever hat I have to wear if it's pastor hat, daddy hat, grandpa hat, whatever hat, I'll never do it perfect. We, you, all of us are a work of God's grace. God provides grace through our lives. Look at the verse 13. Look at my clock again. Verse 13, sustaining grace. And I have given you a land for which ye did not labor, and cities which ye built not, and ye dwell in them of the vineyards and olive yards which ye have planted, not not do, which ye planted not, do ye eat. In other words, I provided things for you. Those things they didn't do anything for. God just gave it to them. And even if we do something and God provides, it's God's constant sustaining grace that gives us the ability to just keep doing what we're doing if you're breathing there's enough grace for you to carry out whatever god wants you to do there's no excuses quickly let's get to the last thing in verse 14 and 15 i'll call this motivating grace we've seen initiating grace providing grace sustaining grace i'll call this motivating grace but here's joshua's applications from this text be my applications for this morning's message. In verse 14, he says, Now therefore fear the Lord. There's number one. Serve him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord... Choose you this day whom ye will serve. And he ends it up with a little personal testimony at the end of the verse, 15. But as for me, my house, we will serve the Lord. Four things really quick. Fear the Lord. The word fear, and you've heard me talk about this, Old Testament, New Testament, the idea of the word fear is that respect and that reverence and that awe. I mean, I, I don't know but what I'd have been like them at Mount Sinai, you remember Mount Sinai when they kind of got their first taste of God and there's thunder and there's lightning and the ground's shaking like an earthquake. And you remember what the people said? Look, Moses, we appreciate God talking to us like, like him talking about straight to us. But if it's okay with you, just let him talk to you. That was a little scary. So it's not like we're afraid of God, but boy, God's God. And we ain't. But more 
the word means conscious of. Your life is always aware of. I think that's constantly what my mom was selling. She, she didn't make me take my Bible anywhere. You know, she used to push me to do stuff like that. She didn't make me. Uh, she, she didn't tell me to put my Bible, you know, between me and my date. You know, I always kept, that used to be the joke. You know, if you keep Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John between you, whatever, fix things up. But you, you remember the little thing I've always told you. Mom would always look at me and say, remember your, who your father is. She was always trying to get in my mind to be conscious of God. That's, that's what he's telling them. It's not like they were going to forget the Red Sea. I mean, who could forget that? It's not like they were going to forget, like, the deliverance from Egypt. But what they forgot was, was how they needed to live conscious of that and their heart be driven to a life of worship, service, and obedience. That should be the drive. Secondly, he says, serve him in truth and sincerity. Serve is a word that's in the New Testament. It actually means worship. So he says, I want you to worship God. Worship, we think about coming to a church and singing songs. And I'm not saying that's not worship. But worship is more seen by your life. The word worship and the word serve there means to assign worth. So in other words, you, you, you show the worth of something or the value of something with your attention to it. Like, like we would think about it with, with how much money we spent. Remember when the, the lady came, the alabaster box, and the money she had saved up, and she gave it all to Jesus? Jesus made sure they understood how much she gave. Or the widow's might was very little, but she gave all she had. She didn't have anything in a 401k. She gave it all. Jesus said, man, that was great. That was much. That's what he's saying. That God is so valuable to you. You show his worth. How do you show his worth? By coming to church. How do you show his worth? You can't live a day without his Bible being in your heart and in your mind. How do you show his worth? By sharing his truth, his gospel witness to everybody you see. That's how you show his worth. Where you spend your effort. He says, serve him in sincerity and truth. Listen, what we're doing this morning is easy. I mean, where have we been here? It's 1128. We ain't even been in this room an hour yet. We was back there for... 45 minutes, a couple hours. This is easy. We'll be back tonight. 5 30, 6 30 tops. Piece of cake. Three hours. Wow. There's a bunch of people sitting out in a football game right there. Got cooked like bacon yesterday. Three hours. And if it went into overtime, woo! Right? There's overtime in here. Come on. Does he not know what time it is? Worship is when, when you really put worth on something. Thirdly, you confess sin. He says, put away the gods that your father served on the other side of the flood. Confess sin. You confess sin. You identify stuff in your life that just don't need to be there. I'm constantly seeing things in my life. If you're not constantly seeing things in your life, you're either sinless or you're ignoring sin. So we're to be confessors of sin. And lastly, you choose to follow Christ. It's an intentional, daily routine and a choice that you make to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about a work. You intentionally decide every day, this is God's day. Next day, this is God's day. The Hebrew word there, choose, is, is, a, is a repetitious Hebrew word. It's not like a one-time thing, one trip to the altar, one decision made. It's constant. It might even be a couple times during the day where you're reminding yourself, I am a follower of Christ. He is my God. He has my attention. That's the most worth thing in my life. And I want to serve him faithfully. So I choose, I choose, and I don't want any sin in my life to distract me or dishonor him. I want to follow him with my You intentionally make that decision. We all have the issue of making something, someone, whatever, a God in our life. There's a lot of good things in our life, but you don't ever want a good thing to become a God 
thing. God's God, and we need to keep him in his proper perspective. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Maybe God's spoken to your heart. This morning, maybe you're here and you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't, I would encourage you to come. Someone to take God's word and show you what it means to be a Christian. We won't talk to you about joining the church. We'll talk to you about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. Maybe you're here, you are a Christian. And maybe your grace story is amazing. But how, how's it impacting your present story? Are you aware of God, consciously aware of God, serving Him, worshiping Him, confessing sin, and following Him in your life? As we stand, if God's spoken to your heart,